In a remote tunnel, deep within the Judean desert, an unsolved mystery of a priceless treasure. It started with Abraham, was assembled by Moses, enshrined by King Solomon. Its fame would summon kings and beckon pharaohs. Its glory ravage foreign gods. What was the source of this might? Is history about to unleash its desert secrets? The quest for the temple treasures and the Ark of the Covenant. Jehovah's Treasure. Party shalom to all of you. Jeffrey Seif here, pleased to welcome you to another edition of Zola Levitt Presents. We're presenting here the second of a three-part treatment of a series called Jehovah's Treasure. Therein, we follow archaeologists, journalists, and others that take us to the biblical world and search for lost treasures, the greatest of which, of course, the greatest treasure of all is God's covenant people. Last week, we went up to the Jordan. Now we cross it with Joshua as we continue the story in the biblical word. And as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, the waters were cut off. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground under Jericho, and the people encamped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. At that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives, and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. Rabbi Uri Einhorn. Well, we're talking about the second circumcision um, in the Jewish history. The first one was before they left Egypt. They wandered 40 years in the desert. In that time, they could not circumcise themselves. It was a very harsh atmosphere. So when they came back and into the land of Israel, they had to circumcise themselves again. This was a covenant with God. And so there was a massive circumcision. It says that they circumcised themselves means each one created a knife and circumcised the other person. That's what we talk about, the second circumcision, second massive circumcision. For the children of Israel, the conquest of Jericho was key to the penetration of Canaan. So formidable were Jericho's walls that 40,000 Israelite soldiers would not even attempt to penetrate the mighty city. God had other plans. And ye shall compass the city six days. And the seventh day, ye shall compass the city seven times. And the priests shall blow the trumpets and shout with a great shout and the wall of the city shall fall flat. Today, archaeologists are divided on what actually happened here at Jericho, yet the biblical account is supported word for word by the Dead Sea Scrolls found in the nearby caves of Qumran. Meanwhile, a short distance away, a lingering mystery Members of Gutfeld's crew gather by the new tunnel to study a survey of the area. Cave number 66 that's mentioned in the book by just one sentence mm -hmm. doesn't say anything about what's in the cave. And that's when they dug and found it empty at 130 meters deep. And where we are now is where this blue line that was never mentioned. Okay. It's a new archaeological dig and never mentioned in any of the surveys. And what made Orin dig here? And now? And why? The Ark of the Covenant has finally made it across the Jordan River into the Promised Land. But it won't find its home here in Jerusalem for many years to come. This mysterious Golden Ark is beginning to get a reputation, even among some of Israel's enemies. They've heard about this God of the Israelites. He's made some kind of a pact with his people, apparently chosen to see them through despite their hardened hearts. Shiloh is located in the heartland of the country, barely 20 miles from Jerusalem. It would become the center of worship for some 400 years. The tabernacle will be erected here, in this quiet, uninhabited valley. All of the artifacts used in worship remain intact. The seven branched golden menorah, 
altar of incense, the table of showbread, each with a specific purpose, overseen by specific priests from the tribe of Levi. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest had the venerable task of parting an immense linen curtain to enter the Holy of Holies. To be in this room was to be in the presence of Almighty Yahweh, Jehovah. Every move is planned, every step calculated. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times upon the mercy seat. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. You probably heard it said that a church really isn't about sticks and bricks. It's, it's not about the steeple, it's about the people. It's about us, the people of God. What's true conceptually in the New Testament is also true in the Old. Oh yes, a massive temple was built and there were lots of treasures, but the greatest treasure of all, from God's perspective, is Israel, the apple of God's eye. In the New Testament, the people of God were purchased at a very great cost. God so loved the world that he sent his son into the world to shed his blood. And even the idea of bloodshed is not new to the New Testament. In fact, in the Old Testament as well, God made a covenant with the people of Israel through the shedding of blood. In fact, the word covenant in Hebrew, berit, it says karat berit in the Hebrew. He cut the covenant. And it harks to the idea of the sacrifice that God would have made for his covenant people. And we'll spend more time on that story now as we journey on. The biblical period that follows Joshua's death is known as the time of the judges. The formative nation seeks to establish itself, moving ever westward through the lush hill country. Here, they'll once again encounter a consortium of enemies. And here they'll fall prey to the beckoning of foreign gods. In present-day Ashkelon, evidence has been found of Israel's arch enemies, the Philistines. Archaeologist Ian Stern. The Philistines were part of a mass movement of peoples in the 13th century BCE, making their way from Greece to the area of southern Canaan, setting up five cities known as the Philistine Pentopolis. They brought with them a well-trained army, an army consisting of archers, consisting of cavalry and charioteers. They also brought with them distinctive pottery from Greece. It was inevitable that these people would eventually clash with the Israelites in the mountains. The Israelites inched their way down from the mountainous area towards the coastal plain, meeting with these Philistines in their northern city in a place that was called Aphek. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines pitched in Aphek, and the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines. At Afek, Israel would lose two battles, 34,000 lives, and most tragically, the Ark of the Covenant. It was bad enough that the Israelites should lose their battle at Afek. To lose the Ark of the Covenant to the Philistines? It was unheard of. Nothing could be more disheartening, or so it would seem. But the Bible records that during this period of the Judges, the children of Israel had reverted to idol worship. They were no longer listening to their covenant God. In the absence of leaders like Moses and Joshua, even the priesthood had become corrupt. The captured Ark of the Covenant would be taken into the Philistine temple in Ashdod. Being a people of the sea, the Philistines based their chief deity on a creature from the sea. And so it was, on this extraordinary evening that the Holy Ark shared a room with a foreign god. Named Dagon, the fish god. This was a night for a fateful confrontation. The 
Philistines arose early in the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord, and his head and both palms were cut off. And the men of Ashdod said, The ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us. And God smote the city of Ashdod, and they sent the ark of God to Ekron. For seven months, the ark would travel from one Philistine city to another. At each site, the results were the same, plague and death, such as the Philistines had never known before. It had become quite clear that they could not harness the might of this Israelite God, who they perceived must be living in this troublesome golden box. Clearly, the ark had to be returned to its rightful owners. Of course, the question was, were the Israelites really ready for the ark's return? Had they learned anything in its absence about the God who delivered their forefathers out of Egypt? They would soon find out. In a weird twist of fate, the Philistines decided to return the ark. Well, sort of. They figured if an unmanned cart could make it all the way back to the children of Israel, it would be a sign that the ark rightfully belonged to the Israelites. Miraculously, the unmanned cart finds its way to Beth Shemesh, a city owned by the Levites. As they were reaping their wheat harvest, they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. And they took the wood of the cart and the cows thereof and offered a burnt offering unto the Lord. Unfortunately, there were still some more lessons to be learned. Moses had been given specific guidelines regarding the handling of the Holy Ark. Respect was paramount. And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the Ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people 50,000 and three score and 10 men. Despite God's continued efforts to commune with His covenant people, they just didn't seem to get it. Their exuberance was so much lip service. Their actions proved that they were quite content, living in pride. In the absence of any spiritual authority, the ark would be placed in a private residence at a place called Kiryat Yerim. <laughs> And the men of Kiryat Jerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass, while the ark abode in Kiryat Jerim, that the time was long, for it was twenty years. We're standing on a hilltop not far from Jerusalem that was identified in 1838 by Edward Robinson as the place of ancient Kiryat Yarim, the town of the woods, the site where the Ark of the Covenant resided for 20 years. He based his decision or his identification on the fact that we're standing between the tribal area of Judah and the tribal area of Benjamin. This was reinforced by the fact that right here in front of us we have a mosaic floor dating from the 5th century, part of what was a Byzantine church. What we know of the Byzantine period is that many churches were built, and those churches were built to mark a biblical event. Very possibly here, the place where Avinadav and Elazar, the guardians of that ark for 20 years, had their home. Also in this spot is a church built in 1924, the Church of Our Lady of the Ark of the Covenant, also marking that same spot. But what we do know is it was in this area that the most valuable treasure in the world, the Ark of the Covenant, resided for 20 years before David brought it with him to Jerusalem. For insightful perspectives of Israel and Bible prophecy, ask for our free monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter. When you call, be sure to ask for our free catalog with the latest videos, books, and music. Our correspondence course, the Institute for Jewish Christian Studies, includes reading packets, teaching CDs, and mail-in tests. 
You may want to join us on an upcoming tour of Israel or Petra, or cruise the Mediterranean visiting Greece and Ephesus. Please contact us for more information. Would you say that everybody and anybody that, that wants to make the trip to Israel should do so? Yes, it is worth the trip. It is worth the time. It is worth the money. You say this with passion. Oh, I tell you, I'm so happy that I came. It's just uh, such a privilege to be able to come where our Lord was born and crucified and was risen. For tour information, call 1-800-WONDERS. Israel has been making people happy for centuries. People just like me and people just like you. Call 1-800-WONDERS if you're wondering about going. I promise you, as you make your journey from the womb to the tomb, you'll have two weeks that you will never forget. Come to Israel. And if you can't go with us, we'd be happy to take you there vis-a-vis -vis our monthly magazine, The Levitt Letter, chock full of stories from Israel, about Israel, about biblical archaeology, history, current events. We want you to have it. Call 1-800-WONDERS and you can get it. Or you can go to www.levitt.com and you can pick it up there. Speaking about picking up, if you're really enjoying this series, Jehovah's Treasure, the series is going to be the offer that's going to come later in this program. We'd love for you to have this as well. The DVD contains, beyond the program itself, materials that didn't make it to the 30-minute program series. But there's, there's lots more. We want you to have it. Speaking of lots more, come with me now. We're going to go underground. We dig Israel, and we do it shovel by shovel. Come and let's look at some tunnels and join archaeologists today. I believe that not the, the people who were hidden the treasures made the tunnel. Because the Essenes or someone else who hid the, the treasures, couldn't do such a huge project. This project connects to someone very, very rich, very healthy, very important, maybe even a king, one of the Hesmonian kings, or someone who relates to Herod the Great. So until now I believe that it's some, somehow connected to a tomb and perhaps used in secondary use to hid the treasures that are mentioned in the Copper Scroll. An intriguing parallel has emerged. Gutfeld's tunnels seem to closely resemble those found in the Egyptian pyramids. In a section, it looks like a, a pyramid. Although uh, the, the photos of Okania or the mountain of Okania is uh, artificial, is natural, of course. Uh, but if you look in a section, you can see that the tunnel goes down in 35 degrees, like in the pyramids, exactly under the top of the hill, uh, like a pyramid actually. And there is perhaps yet another connection with Egypt's Great Pyramid. At high noon on the summer solstice, an angle cast by the light reflected off the pyramid intersects the likely site of the Red Sea crossing, the Jordan River crossing, and Bethlehem. Is it a coincidence that this same line passes through Arcania, the site of Gutfeld's mysterious tunnels? A short distance from Harkania, in the caves of Qumran, is an oasis called En Gedi. Still today, as if out of nowhere, this remarkable refuge surprises visitors with lavish waterfalls and hidden caves of its own. It's here that one of Israel's greatest leaders would ready his heart for the direction his people so desperately needed. David, shepherd, Musician, warrior, now king of all Israel. I have found David my servant. My mercy will keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. With Israel's leadership again in capable hands, you'd think that things would run smoothly for a change. Unfortunately, in his enthusiasm to have the Ark brought here to Jerusalem, King David apparently forgets some very important details. 
First of all, the job of transporting any holy treasure should be left solely in the hands of the priests. Secondly, it should never be touched except by the priests. To abide by this law meant life. To break this law meant death. And they brought the ark out of the house of Abinadab and set it upon a cart. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the cart. And when they came to the threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. We're standing here in Area G of the City of David excavations, a site where 3,000 years ago, David and his men were going to conquer the city, which was at that time the capital of the Jebusites. The Jebusites had placed their lame and their blind on the walls and gates of the city, mocking David's army. David ingeniously, with the help of his commander-in-chief Yoav, go through what is called in the Bible the Tsinor, the water tunnel. They climb through the water tunnel, enter into the city, and then run to the water gate, opening the city up, allowing David's army to come through, making this at that point the city of David. Behind us over here is the stepstone structure. And above that structure, a palace, probably the palace of David himself. It was in this city that David later on will bring the Ark of the Covenant, where it will eventually have its final resting place. Despite his palatial surroundings, David had come to revere his source. He hath given food unto them that fear him. He will be ever mindful of his covenant. Holy and reverend is his name. This time David would do it right. He would bring the ark to the center of his city, being careful to do so in accordance with the commandments given to Moses. Thus began the process that transformed a Jebusite stronghold into Jerusalem, the holy city. Then on that day, David delivered first this psalm. Be ye mindful always of his covenant, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, even of the covenant which he made with Abraham, and of his oath unto Isaac, and hath confirmed the same to Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. In this wedding celebration just outside of Jerusalem, the spirit of David endures. The covenant as an agreement is totally in effect. It's like the wedding ring between the groom and the bride. So the relationship is between God and mankind, uh, and the Jewish people particularly at, at Sinai. The, the Ark of the Covenant, or the, actually the Luchot, they're called the tablets of the Ten Commandments, is the symbolic ring. So when there's a marriage, even if the ring gets lost or temporarily misplaced, marriage is still very uh, vital. Meanwhile, deep within Oren Gutfeld's tunnel, something has been found, perhaps a piece of the puzzle. Now I need money for uh, C14 test. <laughs> <laughs> to Gutfeld, even animal bones can be clues. Further evidence that his tunnels date to the period of temple treasure. The clues from the Copper Scroll remain paramount, however. His tunnels are located in the Sahaha Valley, or Shadow Valley, mentioned five times in the scroll. Further, some of the treasure is specifically indicated as being located under the steps of a tunnel. In the journey from the Sinai to Jerusalem, the Ark of the Covenant has been the source of life and death now for nearly 450 years. Through deserts and rivers, 
over mountains and canyons, into the very temple of a foreign god. As a little boy growing up in a Jewish home, I didn't celebrate Christmas. We did Hanukkah. And I remember as a youngster opening up presents, treasures, and as a little boy being so enthralled, so excited, something about it told me this is a great holiday because of the joy from the toys. Well, it's not about toys. Here we are digging into the biblical word, and we're in search of lost treasures. Next uh, week, we're going to hear from individuals who claim they have seen the Ark of the Covenant and talk about joy, talk about a gleam in the eye. We are doing biblical archaeology. We believe this is TV worth watching as we look for biblical treasures and consider biblical pleasures. Before we go, I want you to know that God so loved the world, he sent his son into it. And the greatest treasure of all would be the treasure that's hidden in your heart in this earthen vessel. If you will but invite the Lord into your heart, repent of your sins, there's a glorious future for you. We look at the future, we look at the past. Thanks for going with us on the journey. And as you go now, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Jehovah's Treasure, the quest for the Ark of the Covenant and the Temple Treasures has been a special presentation of Zola Levitt Ministry. Join us in the Holy Land for a trip of a lifetime. You'll love it, I promise. For tour information, call 1-800-WONDERS. You may order a full-length version of Jehovah's Treasure on DVD with scenes not included in this one-hour special by calling 1-800-WONDERS. Zola Levitt Ministries monthly newsletter, The Levitt Letter, is available for free and includes insightful perspectives of Israel and Bible prophecy. For your copy of Jehovah's Treasure with additional scenes not included in this one-hour special, call 1-800-WONDERS. And be sure to ask for your free monthly publication, The Levitt Letter. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.